Okay, good evening and welcome to our Broadview National Online Reading Club. My name is Jocelyn Bell and I'm the editor and publisher of Broadview. Working behind the scenes to help us out tonight is Sharon Doran, who is Broadview's promotion manager. And we're so glad that you've taken an hour of your evening to come and be here with us. We would love to know who you are and where you're from. So please say hello from your hometown in the chat space. It's just a nice way for us to get to know each other a bit better and to really realize that we're coming from all across Canada to enjoy this evening together. This evening, we're gonna hear from writer Ann Bachma and story subjects, Sean Cribben and Joshna Maharaj. And in a few moments, I will introduce you to these three courageous and fascinating people. After our speakers have told us a bit about uh, themselves and their stories, please be brave and ask questions. We know from our reading club surveys that you want to hear questions and comments from each other and not just from me. So if there's something that you wanna say, please go for it and know that everyone is cheering you on. There are two ways to ask a question. So you can either type, I have a question into the chat and I'll call on you as time allows. Uh, and then you just switch on your audio and ask your question. Or if you prefer, you can type your question into the chat and I'll ask it for you. I would just ask that if there's a speaker who's talking, not to uh, start typing then, and especially not to ask a question that's for a different speaker at that time, as it creates a bit of a distraction for people who are listening. Oh, I have to admit five people in here all at once. So I'm going to begin by introducing Anne Bachma. Anne is an award-winning journalist and longtime contributor to Broadview Magazine. She's also the author of the 2019 memoir, My Year of Living Spiritually, One Woman's Secular Quest for a More Soulful Life, which had its origins as a blog for Broadview Magazine. In our December issue, Anne wrote an opinion column called I Boycotted the Sally Ann Bell Ringers, Now I'm Having Second Thoughts. The piece drew criticism from those who thought Anne was being too hard on the Salvation Army and from those who felt she wasn't heard enough. Whatever your own opinion is on this piece, I trust that we can have a respectful dialogue about the column following Anne's comments. So please join me in welcoming Anne Bachma. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. And um, yeah, thanks for being such a courageous editor to take on this piece. I, I was quite surprised at um, uh, the feedback. You know, there was a lot of, um, people on both sides who were upset about the piece, which I think is always a good sign, actually. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, a quick synopsis for those of you who haven't read it or you've forgotten about the piece. I, I did write this article to try and uh, clarify my conflicted feelings about putting money in the Salvation Army red kettles at Christmas time. I had an issue with the organization's long history of discrimination against LGBTQ folks. And yet I felt miserly, you know, when I would walk by the bell ringers in the grocery store, especially at this time of year when my cart would be heavy laden with foodstuffs for the holidays. And it felt like I was, you know, being principled and, and, and sort of, you know, walking on by, but it also felt to me like I was actually walking by a homeless person who was hungry and, and cold. Um, so this piece allowed me to really examine the Salvation Army's history. I found that there were indeed instances in the past, especially where it has discriminated. It's fought against policies to extend health benefits to same-sex partners, for example. It's promoted organizations that refer gay individuals to conversion therapy. Uh, those things it's not doing any longer. However, it um, does believe marriage should be between a man and a woman. Um, and also its officers are not allowed to be um, practicing um, LGBTQ folks. Um, so, you know, it, I also found out that it's been trying to um, improve its reputation uh, in this demographic. For example, a few years ago, it opened a homeless shelter in Las Vegas exclusively for transgendered individuals. And um, about a year or two ago, it opened a homeless shelter in Winnipeg for LGBTQ youth. Um, so as Jocelyn said, the article did hit a nerve. There was a lot of response. I posted the piece on my Facebook page and had about 70 comments and some of them got, you know, quite testy, which is fine. Uh, I noticed um, in the piece that Broadview's run online, there's also about a dozen or more letters. Uh, so some folks felt I was too hard on the Salvation Army and others felt I should have been more critical. 
um, some of the comments I got were things like, uh, would you ask a starving person a checklist of questions before you gave them food? There is no struggle, just give. Uh, someone else said they may help many, but they also cause harm. Another comment was, I would never give money to an organization that would not allow my queer daughter to hold an officer's position. I'm proudly tolerant of my intolerance to the Salvation Army. To my surprise, several gay friends wrote on my Facebook page that they do give money to the Salvation Army because of its direct action on poverty. Uh, one said it does need to address its inconsistent messaging, which I agree, there is some inconsistency here. But many people said to me that they felt um, a similar conflict about whether or not to put money in the kettle. So I think that's really why the piece uh, struck a nerve and many people thought like me, like, what should I do in this situation? And that's why I think it made for a good story for Broadview, which has a reputation for examining ethical issues. You know, the fact is many organizations that help address poverty are religious based. Governments should be the one helping the poor, but they don't do enough. And so uh, these organizations or, you know, poor people and marginalized folk are dependent on religious charities. That is just the reality. The Salvation Army raises about $20 million a year in Canada um, to help people living on the streets, drug addicts and so on. Um, and I think what makes them different from other organizations is that they have 12, 000, sorry, 2,000 uh, kettles that are spread out across the country. So you can't help but pass by them and wonder what it is you should do. Um, so in my article, I do call on the Salvation Army to make a public apology for its past harms done to the LGBTQ community. Um, I believe it has to decide whether it's an organization that truly supports equality. Uh, but in the end, my own personal conclusion was that I would put five or ten dollars in the kettle this Christmas. Although with COVID, who knows if these kettles will be out in public. And for me, it came down to something quite personal. Um, my mother was a single mom when I was um, around five years old and my brother was two. My father had left. She was in social assistance, had very little money. And it was the Salvation Army who helped her out with a $50 check three Christmases in a row that allowed us to have some presents and a tree. And she said, we wouldn't have had any of that if it weren't for the Salvation Army. So the personal is often what drives us to give to particular charities. And my mom told me a while ago that she still gives them several hundred dollars a year. So in the end, while I wouldn't go out of my way to give the Salvation Army, you know, a check, for example, I have come to believe that its actions trumpets theology. And the way I see it, I'm not giving money to support a church that's known to discriminate, but I'm giving money to help out some poor soul who's lost and alone, hungry and homeless. So that's a little bit about the story that I wrote and I'm happy to take any questions or... We have a question and Anne, I think your, um, oh. your speaker might be just rubbing against your uh, sweater or something. Uh, yeah, I thought I heard something. Maybe unplug. Ah. Are we better now? Is that okay? I think that was. Good. We might um, just check around. Okay, we have a comment or a question from Ray LeBeau. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah. Hi, Anne. Um, I, I read your article and it made me do some thinking for sure. Um, and in the United Church of Canada, we have affirming churches who are very supportive, very welcoming, very non-judgmental with regards to LGBTQ. They perform same-sex marriages. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably wonderful to be a member of an affirming church. At the present time, I'm a member of a United Church that is not affirming. And they don't do same-sex marriages. And now I'm in this situation where I'm and there are churches that are it's a farther drive from where I live in Rockland, Ontario. But in Orleans, there are churches, United Churches, that are affirming churches. And I'm kind of in a dilemma about, you know, because I, I'm not ju a judgmental person. I support the LGBTQ community, uh, welcome them with open arms. And um, we had a very good speaker at the last um, evening that we had who was transgender and very emotional, very powerful comments from her. And someone mentioned the affirming churches to her. And 
her response to that was, I'm really not ready to be let down again. And, you know, because it, who knows, someone, if someone in the church speaks out against LGBTQ, it starts the ball rolling. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. Like, I, I'm seriously thinking about changing churches because I want to belong to an affirming church, one that welcomes, because, you know, like, when you say everyone's welcome, you better mean it. Right. Yeah, I totally understand your point of view, Ray. I myself am a Unitarian, and um, and I would say all of our 50 congregations are affirming in Canada, definitely. Um, and I'm not sure how it works in the United Church, why some churches are affirming and, and others aren't. Um, but I certainly understand the feelings of people who, who don't want to be let down and hurt again, because religion you know, a traditional religion has hurt a lot of people in this community deeply. And uh, so, you know, when they see the Salvation Army, they might see something different than you or I. You know, we might see someone who's putting warm food on a plate and, and giving someone a bed to rest in. But for people who um, are in this community, they are deeply suspicious and, and, and hurt by an organization like the Salvation Army. But having said that, there's so many Catholic charities and you know, so many charities in Canada are religious run that it's difficult to know, you know, um, you know, who to give money to and who not to give money to. I think for me, what makes a difference, as I said, with the Salvation Army is they're right there in front of me. You know, I'm not, I wouldn't write them a check, but when I walk by them, I, I do feel like a Grinch. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Um, so we have a, a Peter Wilkins commenting that uh, he agrees with you on supporting the work of the Salvation Army uh, for the work that it does for those in need in Canada and the third world. Uh, let's move to Doug Jameson, uh, who has a comment for you. Uh, thank you for your article, Anne. Um, here in Vancouver, our cathedral space, St. Andrews Wesley, does an annual uh, conference during Pride Week. And two years ago, I was surprised to find myself sitting in a discussion next to two officers of the Salvation Army. <laughs> and they went on to tell me that things are changing slowly. Uh, the issue is coming up in front of the entire organization or the army, whatever you want to call it. And those of us who have a long history in the United Church remember that change does not happen quickly. So um, I have my own reasons for boycotting the Salvation Army, which I might leave on your Facebook page, Anne. But, uh, you know, um, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I returned to the United Church uh, at First United Church in the very difficult downtown east side of Vancouver. And uh, the Salvation Army does follow the path of Jesus in many ways. And I, we, all, we all should pray that they will continue and uh, join the 21st century eventually. Thank you. I, I'm curious, Doug. Um, so you said you have your own reasons. Uh, uh, so, so how do you feel when you walk by a kettle? Like when it's right there in front of you at the grocery store, or do you feel like certain that you are not going to put money in there? Do you feel a twinge or... How do you feel? I... I feel certain I feel no twinges. And my, my antipathy goes back 30 years when the Salvation Army was doing a toy drive for children in Toronto. And the Toronto gay community, that was back before the alphabet soup of LGBTQ, the gay community got behind this drive, got lots and lots of toys, and their donation was turned down by the Salvation Army who, to my eyes, would rather see a child go without than to admit that, uh, you know, the gay community can be charitable and also be doing the work of Jesus. Wow, okay. Um, that's heartbreaking to hear. I want uh, to, I want we to have, for that. I think uh, Mary Baxter has a comment. Uh, do you want to read your comment, Mary? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciated the discussion in, in the article because I feel the same way. I have this split thing about it. I've, I volunteered at the Kettles because I was part of 
our chamber, local chamber of commerce round table and they were looking for volunteers. I did it for a number of years and you know, the, but um, always feeling a little funny about it and saying, well, I'm not, I'm not a member, you know, of this church, this, this church. but um, like, like Anne, I feel that I, if, with, with a kettle in front of me, I will put money in. But today I saw tap and go kettles at the Upper Canada Mall in Newmarket. And I think we have some here in our local community too, a couple of them. So, so uh, remember a few years ago on the kettle saying, saying to them, you know, you really should have um, inter interact. And they said, oh yeah, right, 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 right. Well, now they do. So there you go. <laughs> but thank you, Anne. I really appreciated the, uh, the conversation because it's been, it get, it's on my mind every Christmas. Mm. I just remember, Jocelyn, I did a piece for Broadview like two or three years ago called Panhandler Protocol. That's Mary, right. Your comment reminded me of that. Again, you know, what to do about giving money to homeless people on the street. Because, you know, many people say you should give it to the organizations that help them. And, you know, is, is it feeding their addiction or is it a compassionate thing to do to give them a few dollars? You know, I felt the same mm -hmm conflict it's not always exactly clear uh, you know what is the best course of action so it's great to explore these things okay we have a, a comment from rob metcalf go ahead rob uh just uh, information for ann uh, united churches each one makes its own decision uh, about becoming affirming and goes through um, a fairly lengthy period of preparation in order to be accepted as an affirming church. Those, that, that's the process. Okay, thanks. Uh, Alan, you have a, con a comment for Ann. Alan Hux. And I'm on the, the same theme I was going to say. I think it's the congregationalist heritage of the United Church that each congregation looks at the issue and makes the decision as Rob just explained. Okay, thanks. Um, John, did you want to make a comment directly or do you want me to read it for you here? Uh, I'll uh, speak to it if you don't mind. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I heard Mayor Ninchi a couple of years ago speak at a poverty conference and he just said there's always all kinds of people debating who should be doing what and how to help, but if someone is hungry, just feed them. And uh, and I think we often get caught up in all kinds of issues, as this article shows, that distract us from just, just feeding them. And uh, I've run into this a lot in interfaith activity around anti-poverty action. And, you know, if you go to a, a mosque and to pray and uh, to work on a feeding uh, homeless in downtown Toronto and you know, women sit in one side and men sit in the other. Is that the reason why you shouldn't feed somebody or you feed somebody and uh, let them observe your actions and who you are? You can control who you are. You can't change them, but maybe your behavior will bring them along uh, or at least open a dialogue where one didn't exist. But uh, we, we get caught up in this all the time, and I, I'm concerned that because of the evangelical uh, actions in politically going on these days uh, in the States and in Canada, I, I think we lose sight of the fact that there's lots of good people doing lots of good work, uh, and we just, we need to find ways to talk to each other, not to, to divide ourselves. And do you want to comment back on that? Um, yeah, you know, I, I I still feel a bit conflicted, to be honest. Um, you know, because people have written to me and said, well, you know, of course we should help the poor, but why can't we give money to an organization that's not religious? Because there are some out there, you know. Um, so if it weren't for my personal history with what my mother told me, I, I don't know what I would do. I, um it, it is a tricky one you know it is a tricky one but in the end what i said in my own mind was when i that person at the kettle i sort of replaced them with someone who needed help i don't believe the money is going to support the church the building the salaries 
I do believe that money for that kettle campaign goes on the street. So um, in the end, I feel okay about that. Can I actually ask a quick question here? You're uh, allowed, yes. Forgive my ignorance about this. I don't know enough. But does this anti-LGBTQ position with the Salvation Army mean that they won't uh, serve clients, potential clients? Uh, do, they, do they discriminate on who they, they offer support to on that basis? Not at all. No. Okay. And in fact, they have statements on their websites addressing this because they, they, have, they have had a past history of being anti-gay marriage, right. anti-extending health benefits to same-sex partners and that sort of thing. Um, but now they are going out of their way to actually open shelters uh, to LGBTQ folks right. who make up a huge portion of street people and that's the thing because yeah. of discrimination in their own families and being yes. rejected and mental health issues so you know they actually probably help more folks in this demographic than mm -hmm. any other charity so it's quite ironic indeed will thank they, you for will, that. They, will they ever come out and say you can be gay and be a salvation army officer i think that i don't think so right so that's a problem right. Indeed. We will have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so oh. much, Anne. That was excellent. And, uh, and you know, still so much to unpack with your piece and so much to think about. And even with the wider if issues, whether it's the Salvation Army that we're weighing the values of or another organization or all the many decisions we make where we have competing values, I think you've brought uh, very, a very thoughtful perspective and well-researched perspective to your piece. So thank you. Um, so we are going to move along to Sean Cribben. Sean spent 25 years of his career committed to the education of small children. He retired in 2015 because he lives with Parkinson's disease. In our December issue, Sean was featured in a story called A Survivor's Guilt by Selena Gallardo. The story details how he narrowly avoided death at the hands of Toronto serial, serial killer, Bruce MacArthur, and how he continues to struggle with the question of why he survived when others did not. His story is now available as a feature length film called I Was Next, The Sean Cribben Story. And we'll post a link to that site in the chat. Sean is also working on a book chronicling his journey from victim to survivor. And so please join me in welcoming Sean Cribben. Hi, <laughs> how are you? Um, in the summer of 2017, just to recap, the, um, was I found out that I was a victim I did not know until six months later until he was arrested because at the time I was drugged unconscious and he took a photograph and the photograph was the, the item that the police were able to show me. So I was I called into um, question, questioning uh, the day after his arrest. And that's when I found out after I went unconscious, he had handcuffed me to the bed. He had, um, put a hood over my head, duct tape over my eyes, and he had the murder weapon, which had the DNA of Selene Nesson and the DNA of Andrew Kinsman, the two previous victims, and as well as my DNA on it. And it was pushed up against my throat in the photograph. But the day of, I come to, and it was, it was the luck of his roommate coming home four hours earlier than expected that interrupted his killing process. I came to, unless someone tells you you were unconscious, you don't know. So I just thought I missed a blip in the sentence. And then I went home and went about my day. Um, the trauma that came after was, was so multi-layered. I'll go into that later. But uh, how I came to um, Broadview was uh, Selena Gallardo is the partner, is my partner's son's girlfriend. So I sit across from her at Christmases and uh, Easter's and whatnot. And it was, um, she was still in journalism school at Ryerson and it was her birthday. And this was just after I found out and I'd already agreed to do um, an interview exclusive with uh, one station because someone had leaked my name to the press and I knew they were on my trail. So I was advised to uh, get ahead of the story and do um, an interview on my own. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, Selena, I didn't have a present for her that day. So I just said, listen, would you like second crack at the story? Because it was at the time and still is uh, on and off one of the biggest stories 
that was in Toronto News at the time. So um, she accepted, and it was, I've got to say, like, I loved the article. Um, it was three years of being re-interviewed and re-interviewed because she kept updating it, and then, uh, but uh, the end product, and plus, I want to give a shout out to your photographer because um, that was like a, a therapy session. Uh, as you can tell in the photo, I had cried. He um, had me close my eyes and discuss things and then open them and then clip. It's not the most flattering photo, but but I was, um, it, it was very, uh, it was a good day with your photographer, so thank you. Um, now, the events of the last three years, I would say opened my, my eyes to, to learn a lot about myself, to learn a, a lot about people in general, about the human race. And when I say that, I'm talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I was uh, privy to um, all three. Um, it was hard at times, and but it was the good that got me to move on and through it. And when it comes to the issue of whether I will ever find peace with this, I don't think it's possible because there's eight men who died. And people would say to me, you were saved for a purpose. You were saved for a purpose. No one was telling me what that purpose was, but they were telling me I was saved for a purpose. But I, can't, I don't think I was um, because I was no more or less valuable than those other eight men. I was saved because I was lucky. And... I decide, I choose to have purpose and turn my, what happened to me into a teachable moment and go forward and tell my story and in the hopes that I can educate people, not just about internet safety, which was the very basic. Um, I'm talking about when they choose to um, deal with someone in trauma, like advise them, don't advise someone in trauma what they should have done because they did whatever they did to survive it. So um, there's, a, there's so many multiple um, teachable things. And the biggest of which was, um, I, I can now look back and say this gave me my It's a Wonderful Life moment. Because if I had not been in that situation where I was almost killed, all the people that I had impacted in my lifetime, they decided to then take that opportunity to come and tell me how I changed their life in a positive trajectory. I would have never got that if I would have died not knowing of old age, but it compelled them to do it. And it taught me I am a valuable person and I do have a positive impact on the world. And that was very, very, um, that's a life-changing epiphany. And I, I urge others that if they have any individuals like that in their life, to take it with them and to call them, text them, phone them today. Don't wait for something like this to happen to them. So there you go. <laughs> I'm open for questions. Thank you, Sean. That's, that's really profound. Um, you mentioned wanting to educate people. So I'm wondering, you know, people keep saying that you, you were saved for a reason. What are some things that were not helpful for you to hear or helpful for you to hear from people or, or even say or not say or do or don't do if somebody's dealing with a person who's been through uh the kind of shock or trauma you've been through what advice can you give the rest of us who are trying to support that person well the first thing is um i had a lot of people come up to me and said why didn't you punch him in the face why didn't you do this to escape they they weren't re they didn't have all the facts they didn't know what was going on and i understood that enough to just keep my mouth shut and let it go. But in those situations, when someone is, is um, in trauma, let them talk about it listen, and listen to them. Because that was when the big, telling my story was the most important healing device because it, it helped in my head to make me more of a character. I know it's a little bit of lying to myself, um, but you have to, to it, like that was part of the process to get through it. Mm -hmm. You got to uh, sort of trick yourself into um, feeling better and uh, moving forward. And then there's the whole other side, which was um, 
anytime I did a, an interview, it would be posted on YouTube uh, for the television. And there were de open debates about how I deserve to die, um, how I should have been killed that day. Um, I did the mistake of um, reading it because I was curious what people were talking about. And what, some of those were so hurtful and so just took what little wind I had in my sails out that it almost, that was a big low point for me. Uh, my partner advised me not to read them anymore. Um, I cheated once because I wanted to see what was going on again. And um, I, I, I only responded to one woman and uh, that's because she criticized my partner and suggested that I get a new one. Um, and I, I gave her a comment about as if I was sitting in front of her, how would she respond knowing me as a person? And um, I was able to shut her down, but it was a, a Christian woman came to my defense immediately following that. And she was just talking to the whole group of people. Um, like there were hundreds of them. And she was saying, people, he's reading these, have some humanity. Hmm. Yeah. Like, just realize what you're saying and put yourself in his shoes. And um, I, I commend that lady. She was, she's good people. You have a, you have a movie that's out. What was that process like for you? And, and how did it help you through this or did it? Well, the, it all goes back to the wonderful life moment the, because I was being approached by the BBC and Universal and NBC and all these uh, people. And um, this was uh, the gentleman who came to me and did his pitch was someone who 23 years prior ended up in a situation where he was homeless in Toronto and it was Christmas time. And he used to work with an ex of mine. Um, and uh, when I found out he was homeless, I said, that's ridiculous. We have a solarium, he can come move in here. So I took him off the street, didn't really remember it much in my radar after that. Um, it turns out, I, I even asked him, I said, how long were you there? Uh, two weeks, three weeks? And he said, three months. But um, it was Christmas time. I made sure, apparently I made sure he had a stocking, presents to open, little things like that. And he remembered it so much that when he came to me, he said, I want to make this film for you. So you're treated with care. And um, it was, the film became the heal, such a healing force. And that was, uh, it's it captured in the film, but I actually uh, spoke at a tree planting ceremony for in honor of the eight victims. And, um, that was when the community kind of welcomed me back. There's, uh, they, I got, I had a moment of tears and I was turning away to go back to my trailer. And uh, then they just said, oh, I, the director goes, someone, they want to give you a hug. And I turn and there was a hundred people there who wanted to hug me and they just swarmed me. And it, it was wonderful. So oh. great moments that came from that. That's great. Uh, we have a question from Emma and Michael. Go ahead, Emma and Michael. Sean, thank you so much for, for coming to talk with us. Um, I had a question about something you mentioned in the piece, which was uh, sort of near the end of the story, talking about being associated with that experience um, and wanting to, to be seen as a person separate from that. Is that a, a fear that persists of being of that being you or what people think about when they you hear your name? Um, it's, it's, it's switched a little bit because I know, um, I represent eight other men here and I want to be, um, to educate and, and I've even gone broader that it's like just people, I heard about everyone has some trauma in their life that are things that are very up here that caused a lot of people. I'm now a face of someone they identify with. And I accept that, like, because I'm, I'm, helping, I'm helping them talk and um, get toward, move towards their healing. Um, at the time, it was frustration because the first Pride Day after uh, it happened uh, was the anniversary of Andrew Kinsman's going, going missing. And I purposely chose to stay home because I knew it was too fresh and my face being seen, the interview had just aired the initial one on Global and um, it was associated with that. And I, 
I, I believed that the community needed a time to heal and they didn't need to see me that year. So I stayed in, but um, that does persist a little bit. Um, it's, it's more when I'm like in a social, social situation where it's not related anything to that. And it's just like, Oh, you're the, you're the, the, the dead guy or like I get associated with death that, that I could do without. I'd rather be, Oh, you're the one that survived. I want to go actually from victim to survivor to thriver. That's my goal. Uh, we have a question from Alan um, and Selena who wrote the piece is also here tonight. And maybe Selena, you can hop on because Alan's wondering uh, what it was like for you two to work together because you are extended family. And like you said, it's to see each other at Christmas and, uh, and Easter and so on. So Selena, do you want to hop on and, and talk about that a little bit? And then we can throw it back to Sean for his uh, comment. Yeah, um, it was a really great experience because I feel like I just by reporting and writing the story, not only did I grow as a journalist, but also as a person. Um, it was a really um, humbling experience, like learning how to talk to someone that I know who went through something unimaginably, unimaginably traumatic. Um, and it was, and as a journalist too, because I spent three years with him and kind of like keeping track of everything that's going on. Um, originally it was a bit difficult pitching the story just because we had that personal connection. Um, but I'm actually grateful that I was able to spend, like spend a bit more time finding the right publication to, to pitch this to because, um, it was a very sensitive story and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to be sensationalized. Um, and Broadby did a really great job of um, making sure that this story was told with care. They didn't pressure me to add any details that would st further stigmatize the queer community. Um, so yeah, it, it was really great. And I'm very grateful that Sean trusted me with this story. And I feel like we've grown close as, I guess we're like, I don't know how to describe us. You're like a step, step father or something but <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, there was a couple times when the subject got onto um, a little more some details of my life I didn't really want my stepdaughter-in-law <laughs> to know um, but I looked at her and I just said I'm treating you as a professional journalist so I'm telling you as it is and I just said gave her the truth because that's all I can do. And she did very, she handled it very well. I don't know that when I, oh, I guess I won't see you at Christmas this year. But it's <laughs> that we're allowed to get together. Well, Sean, we're really glad that you're, you seem to be doing well and, uh, and you're so courageous to share the story. We've, there's a comment here below um, mentioning that, you know, just thank you for sharing the story and thank you, Bobby, for carrying it. So you're welcome. But it's really Selena and, and Sean who are the heroes in this uh, storytelling. So we're going to move on to a very different topic altogether, and that is with Joshna Maharaj. So Joshna, let me just skim down, is a chef, author, and activist who believes strongly in the power of chefs and social gastronomy to bring more hospitality, sustainability, and justice to the table. She is the author of Take Back the Tray, an account of her work rebuilding food systems and public institutions and you may have heard her on CBC Radio where she hosts Kitchen Help Desk. Joshna's interview with Claire Sibony in our December issue revealed that Joshna's passion for her cause is grounded in her Hindu faith and a profound awakening that came to her while preparing food many years ago at an ashram in India. So please join me in welcoming Joshna. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, it's really, really lovely to be here. What a, what a, what an interesting collection of stories the three of us are bringing to the table here today. That's pretty uh, awesome. Uh, so for those of you who perhaps haven't read the piece, uh, my background, um, my personal background is that I am a Hindu. I was raised a Hindu. And when I, I, I did a degree at university, and curiously, my degree is in uh, religious studies and women's studies, uh, which I thought was terribly fascinating, but it's pretty clear that there's not exactly a job at the end of that. Uh, and so I made a deal with my parents that they would be okay 
with me going to live in an ashram, right, which essentially is a monastery in the foothills of the Himalayas for a year. And that by the time I came home, I would have a plan for the rest of my life. Uh, I know now at 44 that those are only the promises you make to the world when you're 24, uh, because it <laughs> it's sort of laughable. But in the time that I spent there, I was like going for walks and eating mangoes and wrestling with what I felt was my existential dilemma about my place in the world. Uh, these uh, lovely aunties who worked in the kitchen were very concerned about me and what I was doing. They were had lots of questions about who my insane parents were who let me just run off to the other side of the world. And I was 24 uh, and not getting any fresher for marriage. Uh, so TikTok, right? Let's say, and they really were like, we need to save this girl because clearly her parents are not on the task. Uh, so they literally dragged me into the kitchen uh, and they, and I didn't know how to cook. I knew how to cook like some pasta and a can of chickpeas and put that together for my student life. I knew nothing about Indian food. And that's really the question that she was asking me. So they dragged me into the kitchen, they put me to work. Uh, and it's important to know that in, in a kitchen in this place, the, in an ashram, a kitchen is a sacred space. So we work barefoot, sitting cross-legged on the floor, chopping vegetables in our laps, right? There's no steel toes or stainless steel counters or any of that kind of crisp hierarchy. Uh, no, wait, there was definitely hierarchy. But any of that crisp professional chef business happening. And somewhere in there, I fell head over heels in love with all of it, right? And, and for me, the piece that really, uh, that really spoke to me was watching the energetic transmission that happens through the food, right? So, I mean, the way I learned it and what I observed was a day when the head cook uh, was in a crusty mood and he was kind of snarly. And then he came into the kitchen and made the rest of us snarly. So then we cooked lunch that day with the snarl in our face. Uh, and I watched us actually deliver that out to the entire population of people we were feeding. And remember, these are monks and nuns who, you know, to some degree have some awareness of their emotional state and how they're impacted by, you know, the world around them. So it's fascinating to see that even they were susceptible to this, right? They were not immune from this. And then I saw the other side of the picture where he would have seen his girlfriend earlier on and he had a little rosiness in his cheeks and he was smiling and singing in the kitchen and we were smiling and, and we ladled that joyfulness out to people, right? One spoon of dal at a time. And I remember standing there in front of those giant pots of food that we, we stirred with like a boat oar, right, is what it looked like. And I remember thinking to myself, one, oh my God, I could do this. Like someone could pay me to do this. I, this, could, this is a real job. And I really understood the incredible power uh, and responsibility of a cook. Right, uh, and, and, and it made me sort of click into previous lessons that I had about the fact that if the cook isn't happy, nobody is happy. So like on cruise ships or, you know, mining camps, you know, but even just like kids summer camps, the cook has the best accommodations, often some of the highest salaries uh, because they, everybody knows that if the cook is not in a good mood, nobody is in a good mood. Uh, and that, that really spoke to me, right? In terms of the ability to have an exponential impact on people. So fast forward, I sent a proclamation home to my parents, went to cooking school, became a chef. But the thing is, like from day one in cooking school, it was very clear that all of my like feel good, blessing nonsense had no place in that very starched formal environment, right? As it is, I was like two women in a class of 35 men. Uh, and then two, I was the only brown person in the whole class uh, and that and it was super clear that my that this was not the place for me to attempt to plant the seeds of the kind of chef that I was hoping to be right so I was very grateful for the knowledge and the and the and the the, the hard skills about cooking but it was very clear when I left that uh, that uh, I knew exactly what I didn't want to do and I knew where the spaces were not for me but I, I realized that whatever I was going to do as a chef uh, I was going to have to build this thing for myself, right? I was going to have to carve this space out for myself. So look, I'm grateful to tell you that 15 years later, I'm still here to tell the story and I did it and I figured it out. But what, uh, what this piece, this Broadview piece really offered me was a chance to, <laughs> was a chance to fully be honest about the kind of chef I am, right? Uh, because people are not ready 
to hear this conversation about faith and blessings uh, or any of it, right? It gets people a little bit crazy. So instead of that, I talk about uh, accountability and transparency and all these other really sort of colder, more objective things that policymakers and you know politicians and folks really respond to. Uh, but the truth is, there's so there's such there's a there's a whole side of this that doesn't get spoken about, right? Particularly because the work I do is so literally grounded in grassroots communities. Right, and I talk, and we talk a lot. We work a lot with vulnerable folks from a variety of backgrounds, and 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 hungry for a variety of reasons. Um, and the a lot of what I do is about rethinking the systems that create this kind of inequity, right? And really thinking, uh, p pushing our thinking beyond thoughts of charity to like, how can we advocate for just more justice, right? What can we? How can we use our kitchens? Uh, and our meals and, and the way we grow and serve food to, to push for the kind of food system that actually just feeds everybody properly by virtue of the fact that they're human. You know, uh, that's really the connection that I'm hoping to make with my work. Um, but it has been a really fascinating and complicated journey, particularly when I started working in hospitals. Uh, because uh, I, I'm sure many of you have either been in a hospital yourself or visited somebody you love and seen the dismal uh, state of the trays when mealtime, uh, you know, happens. Um, and to me, like, be, like those are just, they're terrible. They're bad calories, right? They're not good calories on those plates. They're not doing anything to take care of the bodies. Uh, and, and we have, like, we have dispensed completely with the need to nurture the spirit of anybody in a hospital bed, right? We are barely taking care of their bodies with the food. And so the idea that the food, that the food would uh, address the spirit is a large distance from that, right? But, uh, and so what I have really tried to do is try to find ways to bring that conversation back in. Because the truth of it all is that part of the reason why we need to care about our food and our food system and who grows our food is because of the, the, because of the life in the food. Right, and this this really starts uh, an exciting conversation for me because what hit me recently uh, was to really sort of constantly go back to what is the original purpose of food, right? Uh, and regardless of how you understand our creation story, whether it be uh, sacred, secular, or sort of indifferent, however you understand it, we were put here with this beautiful system of things that grow out of the ground. Uh, all full of flavor and nutrition uh, to keep us alive, right? And the point about our relationship with food, very basically, is about staying alive, uh, right? And so, and, and the reason we need to care about how the food is grown is because the pesticides and the monoculture and all of these other layers that we add on to sort of manipulate our food obscures our access to that really solid life force. Okay. Uh, and that, right, that is the piece that I really want to dig into. I realize I've gone over my topic, so I'm going to stop sure talking. Yeah, I want to make Thank sure you have time for... Uh, I can go on and on, but yeah. this, uh, being able to be out and have this conversation publicly is a thrill. So thank you for that. Thank you. I love your passion and you had me giggling and just right along with you the whole time. Uh, we have a question from Rob again. Uh, yes, uh, that was a fascinating topic. Uh, what I'm curious about is how Jocelyn and uh, Joshna, <laughs> how yes. they connected. Where, where did you get that story? Oh, uh, actually, Claire Sibony is uh, one of our regular freelancers. And so she pitched the story about Joshna to us. And we thought, fantastic, let's do it. So that's, it's just that simple. We have freelance writers who are that's what they do for a living is they find us great stories and and we get to sit back and say great idea and go for it so okay thank you yeah Josh, now, on the theme of religion uh, oh sorry we have i'm going to let somebody else take it uh kathy okay. has a comment where's kathy Nope. Okay. I'm going to go back to what I was going to say. So on the theme of religion, uh, in the interview, you talked about how in the Hindu faith, food is seen as a blessing. And I was curious if you could just elaborate on that a bit. I think, I think there's something interesting there. What does that mean that food 
the, the blessings of yeah so um so in in the context of an ashram which obviously a very religious environment uh, one of the things that happens before mealtimes is the chanting of the, the entire chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita, which is like one of the base, you know, foundational Hindu scriptures. Uh, and the entire passage is essentially about reverence and worship of the tree, right? And, 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 the, and essentially it's about a relationship with the land uh, and, and deep, deep gratitude for what the land offers up, uh, right? And so it's very, very clear um, that any growing, right, anything that, that, that the land, the fruit that the land produces is a direct gift from the divine, uh, right? And this is, this is populations of people who wait with hopefulness for the rain to come so that good crops, you know, are, are available. And they're, they're really sort of tied uh, in this, in this, with this agricultural tether um, to the, the, the energy of the seasons with the activity of the divine, let's say that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and then Mary Elizabeth Piercy has a question. I'm not sure if it all got written here, but do you want to go ahead, Mary? Hi there. There you um, are. Hello. Joshua, love listening to you on love listening to you on the CBC. Thank so you. I'm wondering how the response has been to your book, Take Back the Tray. Um, I must admit, haven't read it yet. Oh, but uh, wondering if you've had any any possible response to it, et cetera, et cetera. So the response uh, a bit delayed because this thing launched in the beginning of May, which turned out, you know, what I mean, it was there's not the right time to release a book. Uh, so it's been a bit of a delayed response. But I will tell you one of the what I have lost in a bit of sadness that I didn't get to have the party and the release and the sort of bigness of that moment has been that I do not have to do any work to, uh, to explain to people about why I do this work and what I'm talking about, right? We have this gorgeous illustration all around us uh, about how things are really falling apart with the industrial food system and with our public institutions, right? The vulnerabilities are kind of all hanging out right now. Uh, and so to be able to say, I've thought about this and here you go. Uh, <laughs> I have a plan has been a really beautiful gift, uh, right? I have been really delighted uh, about the fact that people are like in this moment where there's just so many question marks about the future and particularly around our food system to be one of the voices that's like, I got a plan, no problem, I'm ready. You know, I just, I'm waiting for this to mean enough to somebody, <laughs> right, to call me. So I am delighted to tell you actually that I have just begun some consultations with a, a lovely small uh, seniors independent living facility just north of Toronto, uh, right? One small little institution who saw what was happening and they've pulled me in uh, and I'm doing Zoom calls with residents about well, what they would like in the dining hall and how they would tend the garden on site. Uh, right. And, and thinking about the kind of menu items that we need to support seniors bodies. Right. There's lots of sweet talk about uh, reducing nightshades and thinking about, you know, anti inflammatory eating and that sort of thing. And that's really joyful work for me. So uh, and, and I can honestly tell you, even in the last month, things have really ramped up in terms of people reaching out for help, uh, which is very, very exciting. So Josh, and I think we have time for one more question and we're going to go back to Kathy because Kathy was having problems. Well, she's here. Amazing. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi. I absolutely love this article. I've been a volunteer with the health unit in, in the community food advisor program, which you probably never heard about. But anyway, the hospital food was the thing that really struck me. Mm. Uh, my father was in the hospital and we had to go and visit him and spend a lot of time there. And you, it was, uh, can I name the hospital? <laughs> but anyway, it, I, I won't name it, but I actually wrote to the administration. Go for it. So upset <laughs> because you could not buy a decent meal yeah. in the hospital. And to me, I agree. People underestimate the healing power of food. Yes. And it was, it not only was the food my father was being fed as a patient, not good, but the people supporting him couldn't get a decent meal either. And I'm happy to say in my little town that I live in, they have a kitchen where they prepare their own food Wonderful. in the hospital. And it's Wonderful. a tiny little hospital. That's the way it's got to be, right? And, and to think about how everybody in that space is eating. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I appreciate the work you're doing and Thank support you 100%. <laughs> That's Thank super you. kind. Thank you. So um, I'm going to wrap us up, but as always, if you want to stick around after uh, eight o'clock and we'll have more dialogue and more chance to chat with all of our guests, uh, please feel free to stay. But I will wrap it up for those who want to be on their way. So thank you so much again for being here tonight and especially to Anne and Sean and Joshna who volunteered their time to make this event possible. We are so very grateful to all three of you. Tomorrow, we'll be sending you a short survey by email so you can share your thoughts with us about this event. Broadview's online reading club is a free event and the costs to produce it are minimal. However, if you'd like to help Broadview continue to feature exceptional humans like Sean, Joshna and Anne, and to hire the writers that have helped to amplify their stories, please consider making a donation to our Friends Fund. You can go to broadview.org slash donate which we'll post in the chat. And there will also be a donations link uh, attached to tomorrow's survey for your convenience. Broadview reading clubs exist across Canada. If you're interested in joining a local club or starting one of your own, please check out our information pages at broadview.org slash reading clubs. If your club isn't already listed here, please let us know so we can spread the word. And it wouldn't be the Christmas season without a plug for Broadview gift subscriptions. Most of you are subscribers, so you already know that Broadview would make a great gift for the friends, family members, and colleagues on your giving list. Please visit broadview.org slash subscribe for information or use the gift subscription postcard in your most recent issue of Broadview. So uh, otherwise, thank you again for being here and be well, and we hope to see you back here for our next online mini club which will be January 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And that's when we'll discuss uh, three stories from the January, February issue. So good night and good night to all who want to be on their way and uh, I'll still be here for a little while. So thank you so much. Thank you, friends.